We all know there are different types or varieties of Dobermans out there, right? I mean, there's the American, the European, there's even the American-European hybrid Dobermans. Then there are show Doberman lines, working Doberman lines, and so on. But did you know that your choice of which of these varieties of Doberman you pick for your next dog could potentially make the difference of years of more or less time with your dog? This is really gonna blow you away, guys, because not all of these types of Dobermans are created equal. Some types are definitely living longer than others, and there's new research out now to show you how drastic this difference is. So there are real life expectancy differences. That definitely seems to be the case. That, that blows my mind. And that's why today we're gonna talk to a Doberman expert, Dr. Sophie Liu, about some amazing new research that her and her colleagues published that finally allows us to compare the lifespan and the health of the different types of Dobermans. And this is not at all what I expected about our breed, guys. So, it's time to finally find out which variety of Doberman lives the longest and which struggles the most with health issues. Okay, hi doctor. Thank you so much for uh, joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. Absolutely, and just for those of you who don't know, and just for a little background, Dr. Sophie Liu is a veterinarian. She's a certified canine dog behavior consultant and a passionate Doberman owner herself. She has her doctorate of veterinary medicine from Cornell University, where she received the foundation scholarship from the Westminster Kennel Club due to her commitment to promoting canine behavior and wellness. And arguably, most notably, she's also the co-founder of the Doberman Diversity Project. It's a nonprofit dedicated to, among other things, reducing the prevalence of inherited diseases in the Doberman breed through genetic research. So definitely the type of person we want on the show to talk about this. So uh, doctor, this research that you did is really exciting to me. Um, I know there was two parts to this research, the first and the second part, um, but I think the first portion is really interesting. Um, what did that portion of the research look at and how did you get your data for that? Sure. So this was a joint collaboration with Robin Nuttall, who does um, health surveys from Doberman owners, and she's accumulated a lot of data from Doberman owners throughout the years. So they report to her, you know, what age their dogs die and what their dogs die of. And that was part one of our study, looking at thousands of dogs who have um, reported deaths, ages of death, and what caused their death. And What's really useful is what pedigrees those dogs come from or what lines they come from. That's really inter interesting. So before we get into like the various lines and different varieties of Doberman, just talking about the Doberman breed as a whole, what did you discover in terms of their overall life expectancy? So it's not great news, but I think it's pretty consistent with what everyone knows, which is that average lifespan, at least in that group of dogs from Robin's data, was about 9.1 years. Wow. So just barely nine years of age for the average Doberman lifespan. Um, other previous attempts to get an average age have gotten around seven to eight. So nine is actually really generous in my opinion, but we are definitely not getting 10 years and up. Wow, you know, it's crazy. We did a study at Doberman Planet. It was a social media study, right? Far from scientific the way we did it, where we just looked at people who, who talked online about their dog passing away. And we just got as many numbers as we could. And we came up with 8.9 years. And I remember thinking, that's got to be wrong. That's got to be like some sort of bias because people are, you know, upset when their dog dies young. Uh, mm -hmm. But it sounds like 9.1, that's like right in the same, right in yep. the same ballpark. That's how, you're a doorman <laughs> owner. How did that make you feel? Um, I... I don't have rose colored glasses. I definitely know what we're looking at and I have insurance on all my dogs. And so this didn't surprise me. If anything, I was like thinking it's a little bit generous. So um, yeah, it was, didn't surprise me at all. So it does seem like there are big differences in uh, variety though, in terms of life expectancy. Uh, and we'll get into that in a second, but it sounds like inbreeding is a big issue that may be at least partially to blame for this. What did you discover in terms of how inbred the Doberman breed is? Yeah, so we know um, the average level of inbreeding in Dobermans. We've known that before. It's about 40%, which is really, really, really high. So when you say 40%, you're, is that the same as a COI? Is that the same? That is, that is the coefficient of inbreeding. Yeah. 
Yeah, their coefficient of inbreeding. I know a yeah, lot of our viewers COI. are. I know a lot of our viewers are familiar with the COI because of like the Embark testings, for example. Mm-hmm. So when you say forty yeah. percent, if they had a forty percent result on that, for example, that would be more or less about average for the breed yeah. Yeah. as a whole. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. So now. As far as the different types of Dobermans or varieties of Dobermans out there, you know, a lot of times there's been, there's all these subjective opinions about the different types of Dobermans out there, but it sounds like on a genetic level from this test, you're able to actually see when you plotted out the genes and the genetics of them, the different clusters of the different types. So there's some true differences between different types of Dobermans. Is that correct? Yes. In the owner reported lines, we got people saying their dogs are Australian or their dogs are from the UK or they're like this type or that type. And and we we took that at face value and mapped their dogs as if they were part of those lines. But when you look at them genetically, they really seem to cluster into kind of four big clusters, which is European show lines, European working lines, American show lines, and sort of American informal or pet lines. And then every one of the other lines that people reported their dogs as being like UK versus Australian versus whatever, they really kind of fit in between those clusters. So, so genetically, there seems to be those distinct clusters, European work, European show, American show, American pet slash informal, and everyone else who's reporting a different line is really somewhere in between those. Okay. So, so that seems to be the big group, genetically speaking. Okay. And Sophie, you said that uh, you focused on the lifespan also on some of the different types of Dorman. And this chart, and I'll put it up on the screen for the viewers, um, it sh- tells us a lot. Tell me what, what we see in this chart here. Yeah, so this is a survival curve. So on the x-axis, so horizontally, those are the ages at which the dogs died. And then on the y-axis, so vertically, that's 0 to 1 or 0 to 100%, basically. Um, That's the percent of dogs that survived. So if you think about it, it means, well, at age 1, all of the dogs of all of the lines are still surviving, which is generally what you'd expect. Unless there's like something really catastrophic or a car crash or something, your dog is probably going to survive past one year of age. But the interesting thing is where it starts drifting apart. All of the different lines have different survival curves. So if you look at the European exhibition, which is the show lines, and European working, which are the orange circles, both of them drop off pretty quickly. So at about age six, you can see there's a sizable proportion of the population that has died off and only 70% of the population is still alive at age six. If you are a European show or if you're European working dog, like Like, that's that's pretty astounding. And by, by the time your European working or European show dog is let's say eight to nine, half of them have died. Right. So the interesting thing is if you look at the European work show crosses, so that's the orange kind of dashed line. If you're at eight or nine, yeah, there's still 70% of you still alive. So, so that's what we meant by inbreeding depression is yeah. individually, those lines live shorter than if you combined them then their offspring will live longer. And that's what we think is also contributing to dogs that are, example, American European hybrid, that gray line. That gray line's looking looking pretty good. It's out there a lot further. Yeah, it's looking pretty good. It is. So yeah, at eight to nine years, if you're an American European cross, 90% of you are probably alive still. Wow. And and you don't really hit 50% of them dying until you're at, what is that, like 10 to 11 years. So it's markedly different compared to 50% of European working or show lines are dead by eight years. Right. And the black line's the average from all of them, correct? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So yes. that's really interesting. It, when you, I like to, I'm looking at nine years of age. So about the mm-hmm. average overall. If you look mm-hmm. at right around nine years, I mean, there's a huge difference between the, the European dogs and yeah. say the the UK or the um, American European hybrid. Yep. That, I mean, that, we're talking like a three Huge three difference. year life expectancy difference almost. Yeah, yeah. So if you look at that nine year mark, only thirty percent of those European working dogs are still alive. But if you are a American European hybrid or a UK dog, you know, like 
80% of you are still alive. That's huge. 30% of you alive versus 80% of you alive. That is amazing. So there are real yep. life expectancy differences between the different types of Doberman. Yes. Wow. Based on owner reported data, that definitely seems to be the case. That, that blows my mind. That mm -hmm. really leads me to ask the question, why? Why are they dying? What's the causes of it? And actually, it looks like you guys had really good data on that too, correct? Yes, we do. So in figure two, um, on the x-axis, you'll see their age at death. So dogs who died at um, one, if they died, they died of something other, the orange bar, which means other. Um, and if they died at age six, for example, if you draw a straight line up from six, then you'll see there's about, let's say, 120 dogs who died at age six. About 50 to 60 of those dogs died of that blue cause, which is DCM. And the rest of it was, you know, other, a little bit of cancer, osteosarcoma, um, other cancer. There's a little bit of like bloat and stuff like that. But for the most part, over 50% died of DCM if you died at age six. And if you keep looking at the ages as they progress, the cause of death starts declining, like for DCM, but the other causes start climbing, like huge jump in cancer, huge jump in, um, well, cancer, osteo, cancer, lymphoma, and then more and more things like wobbler's disease. And then, you know, some people just said old age. So, so the interesting thing about this, which I think is really important, is it's very possible that DCM still is a big killer as the dog gets older, but maybe their owners didn't halter or echo them after like eight or nine years old because a lot of people just don't do it anymore. Yeah. Um, and so the dog still could have developed DCM, but died of other things like cancer. And we just don't know. Right. And so from what you discovered, is it fair to say that American varieties tend to show less DCM than European varieties? So we don't know that for sure. It could be that the European dogs, if they die early and we see that if you die early, it tends to be DCM. It could just be that those European dogs get DCM earlier and maybe American dogs get DCM as well, but they get it later. And at that point, maybe owners don't halter or echo anymore. So you don't really know, but you do know if they die of cancer. So then they'll put cancer as the cause of death. So we don't know. But it's a really good question that ideally you need a sort of prospective study to really look at that. Right. Okay. So I've heard so many times that the Doberman breed is doomed and that like in 10 generations from now, we're not going to have a Doberman. They're going to be so sick or so whatever that, that it's just not even ethical to breed them at all anymore. And the, and the, and the Doberman as we know it is gone. What's your take on that? So I think we are at a pretty critical point. I'm not going to lie about that because like who wants to get a dog with a 50% chance of making it to eight years old, right? right? But that's literally what we have in certain lines. So I would say we're at a pretty critical point, but you can also see what happens, for example, with the UK population, with the American European hybrid dogs, basically they cross the two lines they have a fairly decent chance of making it to 10 years old. And so I think that not all is lost in the breed. And if you look at the genetics part of our paper, very few parts of the genome are fixed. So we do still have variety left in the breed, but it is very small and it's going to require breeders to do things a little bit differently. And I don't know if all of our breeders are open to that and if they're open to, you know, letting science help guide some of their decisions. So not all is lost, but we are at a critical point. Big question. If you were dead set on a Doberman, if you're a buyer today and you're dead set on getting a Doberman, you have to have a Doberman, but your primary concern was how short their lifespan is, what type of variety or cohort of Doberman would you be looking at and why? So I told you this earlier and I do want to emphasize if your number one priority is lifespan, you probably don't want a Doberman. So I want to be really clear about that. However, if you are dead set on it, because I understand, then yeah. for me personally, I think the data suggests that an American European cross or something of that um 
sort of outbreeding is probably likelier to get you longer lifespans from a genetic point of view, from the health span point of view that we're seeing here, you're stacking the cards in your favor with a first generation cross of an American and a European dog. However, not just any random dog, I still would look for longevity in both the mother and the sire's lines. And I would ask for causes of death. And I would ask for Holter and Echo reports on mom and dad, and ideally know the grandparent status as well. So there's a lot of different factors. I think you still can do it. It's, it's hard, though. It's yeah. not easy. So, yep. doctor, what's the big takeaway you want us Doberman owners to or Doberman lovers to take away from this? What's what's the big message here? So I want people to know, like, go in with the breed with clear eyes, like know that everybody keeps getting about eight to nine years average lifespan. If that's still OK with you and you're still motivated for the dog, then you can stack your cards in your favor by looking for a first generation American European cross, probably Um In our data, it looks like the Australian and UK lines also tend to have a little bit more health because they are probably also crosses. So you're probably stacking the cards in your favor, but at the end of the day, look at the family longevity, look at the family causes of death and demand to see Echo and Holter reports or necropsy reports because the more information you have, the more empowered you are to make a good decision. Guys, as you might've figured out, the Dorbin Diversity Project is doing some incredibly important stuff to ensure the future of this amazing breed. right now they're in the middle of moving all their incredibly valuable data into another system that can calculate something called estimated breeding values or ebvs which could prove to be an amazing tool for breeders to use to just lower the risks of disease prevalence overall in dobermans but they need our help really they need two things first They need as much genetic data as possible from us owners, which means testing our dog's DNA and submitting that data to them. And perhaps most importantly, they need updated Echo and Holter test results for your dogs once they have your dog's genetic data. So if you've ever submitted your dog's data to them in the past and you have echocardiogram or Holter monitor results, which you should do regularly after the age of two anyway, by the way, uh, they need that data for the research. And I'll have a link to where you can submit that data to them down in the description down below. And secondly, they're also in need of donations, especially to help with the transfer of data and the development of that EBV tool that I told you about that has huge potential to help this breed. They're a 501c3 charity too, so check with your tax person, but it really could benefit you as a write-off come tax time also. This information is huge to us Doberman owners, guys, so please consider sharing this interview in and amongst the Doberman community anywhere you can. And if you're really passionate about this breed and you wanna stay up on all the critical happenings with this breed, just like this study, for example, um, please don't forget to subscribe down below, click that button and hit the little bell icon next to it just to make sure you turn on all notifications and you don't miss our future release. And a huge thank you to Dr. Sophie Liu of the Doberman Diversity Project for sharing this information with us and to you for hanging out with us today. I'll see you guys on the next one.